know when to strike and how to disappear. Murders stack up, all unsolved. But when a pregnant woman is assassinated, agents vow to stop the violence. A twisting battle ensues, and the line between cop and criminal blurs. Unless agents can solve the case, no one is safe. In the 70s and 80s, a gang of thugs wreaked havoc on the island of Puerto Rico. Organized, experienced, and deadly, they seem beyond the reach of the law. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As a U.S. Commonwealth, Puerto Rico falls under the jurisdiction of the FBI. Agents discovered the gang was run by corrupt cops, men sworn to protect, now out to kill. The fraternity of law enforcement was splintered and at war. July 28, 1977, San Juan, Puerto Rico. New York diamond dealer Stephen Brooks visits the island on his annual business trip. He plans to meet a local jeweler to collect money from an earlier deal. He also wants to sell from the new inventory he's carrying $250,000 worth of quality stones. He's alone with no bodyguard. Brooks is scheduled to return home in two days. On July 29th, Puerto Rico police respond to the discovery of a body outside the city. It's an adult male shot with a 38 caliber gun, then burned severely. There's no driver's license, and because of the fire, a visual ID is impossible. Police find no other clues and bury the murder victim as a John Doe. Four months later, media coverage prompted by Brooks's family helps police realize it was the diamond dealer's body they found. The murder is part of an alarming trend. In the last few years, at least two other U.S. diamond merchants have been killed in Puerto Rico. Special Agent Fernando Candelario. We had transportation of uh, jewelry by individuals coming in from New York specifically. Uh, ended up in Puerto Rico. Uh, these individuals were kidnapped. Their bodies were found later on. Since the slayings have an interstate aspect, the FBI works with local police but no solid evidence points to any suspects. The agents would communicate with their counterparts at the police of Puerto Rico to see if the police of Puerto Rico had developed any leads. But with no leads reported, the cases grow cold. At the time, violent crime is common in San Juan, where poverty mixes with a surging cocaine trade and drug gangs rule the streets. Authorities have trouble sending the powerful gangsters to prison. In March 1979, one major gang leader under investigation for murder silences the only witness to that murder with a gunshot to the head. The gang leader's girlfriend, Jessica Trujillo, witnesses the killing and later agrees to help put the gangster away. Special Agent Jim Bird of the San Juan FBI. She was going to testify in the homicide case against a pretty well-known organized crime character there in, in San Juan. Um, th this girl, because they were aware of the danger, the threats against her, was kept in police custody. Jessica spends her days at the police station. And at night, homicide detectives drive her to her grandmother's house to sleep. The trial begins in May 1980, and prosecutors look forward to finally getting a guilty verdict against a major drug lord. 
But then, on the trial's fifth day, a body is discovered in a sugarcane field near San Juan. It's Jessica Trujillo, the only witness against the gang leader. An autopsy later reveals she was shot twice at point-blank range, execution style. And she was three months pregnant. The only evidence recovered, a Panama hat found near the body. The terrible murder shocks island residents, including San Juan FBI Special Agent D. Rosario. Jessica was very well known in the news media. It was well known that she was going to testify uh, against uh, this other individual whom she witnessed murder another man. And it was well known that Jessica was being protected by the police. The allegations were, at least the rumors initially were, that uh, since she had been in police protective custody, apparently she was murdered by a uh, police officer. Suddenly, the unthinkable seems possible. The Puerto Rico Bureau of Special Investigation, known as NIE, works potential police corruption cases. They ask the FBI for help. It was a matter of trust. Whom do you trust? And the NIE thought it better to trust the FBI uh, than to go to the police department itself uh, and try to find someone there that they could really trust to conduct this investigation. FBI and NIE agents interview the detectives in the homicide division and are stunned when no one claims to remember who had custody of Jessica the day she was killed. No cooperation was obtained at all. None of the investigators were going to talk at all about this thing. It's an ominous turn. Agents get nothing but interference from police officers sworn to protect and serve. The strict code of silence frustrates FBI Special Agent Angelo Class. It was obvious from the outset that the police officers were somehow involved. Either they had given Jessica up to somebody or, or they had uh, killed her themselves. Yet the truth remains elusive. Finally, agents tracked down the officers said to be responsible for escorting Jessica the night before her body was found. Detective Victor Suse claims that he and his partner, Detective Gil Valera, drove Jessica home as scheduled. Their alibi is that they left her in front of her grandmother's house. Victor says he has no idea what happened after they dropped her off. Perhaps someone abducted her. Agents try to corroborate Victor's story. We interviewed many people. We went out to her grandmother's house and conducted a neighborhood investigation there. No one reports seeing Jessica at all that day. And then, the one clue that had been recovered disappears. The Panama hat found near Jessica's body mysteriously vanishes from the police evidence locker. Media reports claim the homicide chief often wears a Panama hat like the one in question. And agents determine the car used to drive Jessica home that night belongs to the Puerto Rican homicide chief himself, Emeterio Benitez. Agents secure the car, and FBI technicians examine it for evidence. Its interior surfaces have been recently cleaned, according to NIE Special Agent Manuel Aponte. If you could smell the bleach on, on the car, we figure out that you know, it was clean because um, something might have happened in this car, something like a murder or something that was trying to be covered. FBI technicians dismantle the car. Beneath the front seat, they discovered dried blood, a lot of it. More blood appears beneath the dashboard and behind the passenger door panel. The way the blood was distributed in the car, we believe that, the, that a person had been killed in that car. Technicians also find ballistic evidence, marks that appear to be from a bullet discharged inside the car. 
At the FBI crime lab, examiners compare the dried blood to samples taken from Jessica at autopsy. But there's a problem making a match. Back then, we didn't have DNA. So the only thing we could say was it was the same type of blood uh, as Jessica's. But we couldn't say that that blood came from Jessica. When agents question Emeterio, the homicide chief calmly explains he bleached the car's interior after transporting a dead animal in the back seat. He says the bullet marks came from an accidental weapon discharge months earlier. He has no idea how the blood got there and explains dozens of people have access to his car due to a tight departmental budget. His car was used by almost everybody in the homicide division. Whenever they were short of cars, they would use his car. He would lend it out uh, so that we couldn't, we couldn't know for sure who might have been in the car. We didn't have enough physical evidence. Circumstantial, yes, but not physical. And when we charge somebody, we really want to go with a case that, that we're extremely confident in that we're going to be successful in its prosecution. So. Uh, we didn't want to. We didn't want to take a chance and, and not be successful by prematurely charging anybody with a crime. Suddenly, instead of one suspect, agents have dozens, and still nothing solid to act on. Somehow, the agents of the FBI and NIE have to break through a wall of silence to get to the truth. In 1980. FBI and Puerto Rico NIE agents suspect corrupt cops were somehow involved in the death of Jessica Trujillo, a government witness murdered while under police protection. Evidence suggests the shocking possibility that Jessica was killed in the car of homicide chief Emeterio Benitez. But it's not enough for an arrest, especially with such a high-level suspect, according to FBI Special Agent Jim Byrd. I mean, there was some circumstantial evidence, but again, this is not a guy with a criminal background. This is the head homicide investigator for the whole San Juan metropolitan area. You can't just say, uh, we think you did it, you're coming with us. Um, the case wasn't going to be solved for, for some time. Because they're investigating cops, and they're not certain who they can trust, Special Agent Angelo Class and the rest of the team cannot allow any leaks. When we started, we were given our own room and nobody was allowed back there unless you were working on the case. The agents desperately need someone on the inside. They check into the detectives who allegedly drove Jessica home, Gil Valera and Victor Suse. We kind of profiled them a little bit. We asked other agents about them. We found out more about these uh, two individuals. And we felt like of the two, the more serious individual, the better cop, if you will, of the two was Victor. And so we decided we were going to appeal to that uh, goodness inside of Victor. At the time, Victor is finishing up his regular National Guard training in the U.S. Agents are ready when he comes back. So we intercepted him at the airport and we told him we wanted to talk to him, and we took him voluntarily to an apartment that we had rented as a safe house. The agents need to get Victor to turn informant. It won't be easy. He started denying having any involvement in anything. We had the wrong guy. NIE Special Agent Manuel Aponte appeals to Victor's sense of honor. I told him, well, listen, if you didn't kill Jessica, I want you to help me out to find out who were the uh, murderers. And you're a homicide detective? I'm not a homicide detective. And you're one of the best homicide detectives. And in fact, he was. So I need your help. They let him know now is his only chance to save himself. The idea was, if you don't cooperate with us, we will conduct the investigation. We probably will charge you and convict you, and you will lose your family. Uh, you'll certainly lose that rank that you're wearing. You will go to a federal penitentiary. And the only way you can avoid this is by coming clean and telling us and cooperating with us. They assure the detective they will protect him. After several hours, 
Victor finally agrees to cooperate. He admits lying earlier. He had not driven Jessica home that night as he first reported. He was told to say that by the chief, uh, that um, he and the other agent did not take her home. He doesn't know who took her home. Victor claims many detectives are involved in a host of criminal activities. They call themselves El Muerta Esquadra, the Death Squad. He started naming people uh, and crimes, and um, we were taking notes, and uh, I mean, for days. Through a series of interviews, the full scope of the corruption becomes apparent. Within the first 10 to 15 debriefing sessions with Victor, we had probably identified about 65 individuals, mostly police officers, that were involved in crime. But uh, they also had, there were some lawyers and uh, some uh, business people. We decided we would then group to find out who was involved in criminal activity with who, and what kinds of crimes they were involved in. And then when we had all these groups, it, it appeared as if though we were dealing with 19 different groups. Special Agent D. Rosario helps identify the corruption's epicenter. The majority of the officers that were involved in corrupt activities came from a specific division within the police department known as the Criminal Investigation Corps, the CIC. The CIC is made up of the highest ranking detectives on the force and the most powerful. Basically, they were their own fiefdom. They were out there doing their own thing. And basically, they did not have to answer to anyone for their action. The CIC runs all drug busts in San Juan. They uh, became very powerful. And so they began to develop a lot of uh, sources of information and, and informants out on the street. According to Victor, those sources became collaborators in a series of armed robberies, kidnappings, even murder for hire. Drug dealers are easy targets for the death squad. No dealer will press charges for stolen drugs, especially if they don't survive the robbery. In every meeting that we had with Victor just expanded more and more our investigation because Victor was able to provide not just names, of people that he personally knew within the department that were involved in committing crimes. But he knew of specific crimes that had been committed. Victor tells agents what he knows about the murder of diamond dealer Stephen Brooks. He says the rogue officers of CIC were tipped off about the broker's arrival by the jeweler Brooks was to meet. They pulled the man over, knowing he was carrying lots of diamonds. My police officer can stop you anywhere. Can stop you uh, uh, on the street, ask you for your title, the gun, and everything. And that's what they practically did. I mean, they, they, they had the power to stop people. The trained officers made sure there were no witnesses. Whoa, 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 whoa. Because the CIC investigated the homicide when it was later discovered, it was all too easy to cover up their crime. Victor's revelations disturbed the honest agents working the case. These weren't men that were total strangers. I knew them. It was appalling. It was just appalling that these men had gone that far. Here were men who had raised their, their right hand and swore to uphold the law and serve and protect. And yet, if, if it had not been for their badges, they were totally indistinguishable from any other common criminal. No matter how long it takes, the FBI and the NIE are determined to stop the death squad. In Puerto Rico, 
The FBI and NIE investigate a broad ring of crooked cops who call themselves the Death Squad. Special Agent Angelo Class leads the complex investigation. The overall objective was to identify as many people involved in public corruption in Puerto Rico as we could and then to identify crimes that they had committed and come up with the evidence to be able to prosecute them. Detective Victor Suse has cooperated, but agents need more for prosecution. One of the first things we had to do was try to corroborate whether Victor was being honest with us or not, trying to corroborate whether we were getting the truth and whether we were getting all the truth from Victor. So we decided to immediately wire him up and use a body recorder and send him up against some of the individuals. Special Agent Jim Bird helps prep Victor for the wired meetings. His mission was to engage in conversation people that, that we thought were involved in this. Maybe they would talk about future plans or talk about past crimes that they'd already committed. That's what we were hoping to get. It's a dangerous assignment. If the corrupt cops suspect a double cross, they'll kill Victor. He was going against other police officers, and he had to be careful. But because Victor was a, a police officer himself, he knew how far to go, how far to push, um, how provocative to be, and how to cover himself. Victor starts with officers he already knows. One of Victor's contacts was uh, Julio Cesar, who had been the head of special arrest team for the police of Puerto Rico. Victor uh, became close to him, hung out with him all the time, drank with him, socialized with him. As Victor records Julio admitting to criminal acts, agents get probable cause to move to the next level of electronic surveillance. We got enough evidence from conversations between Victor and Julio to, to wire up his car and get a wiretap on Julio's phone. With the wiretap warrant, agents can listen to and record any conversation in which Julio discusses crimes. It's not easy, as the rogue cops protect themselves even on personal phone lines, according to Special Agent D. Rosario. Many of the discussions were in code. Uh, they, they were not open conversations. Uh, so we, we had to uh, really uh, uh, study uh, a lot of, of, of people to find out, you know, are they referring to this guy or to that guy? Uh, so we, there was a lot of analysis going on regarding that. One of the detectives that Julio often talks to is Gil Valera. When Gil implicates himself, agents further expand their recording range. We got enough probable cause to go on Hill's wire, and then from there, we identified other people they were involved with. And other things that they were doing and planning, shipping heist and shakedowns and other things. FBI and NIE agents pair off to meticulously develop full cases on each crime discovered. And they would run off with, with this particular case, which was a very significant case in itself, but it formed uh, only a portion of the overall corruption case. So we were investigating 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 cases, if you will, at one time. But so far, no one has admitted involvement in the killing of Jessica Trujillo. Investigators only have one suspect, the head of the Puerto Rican Police Homicide Division. Agents are determined to find the killer and solve the murder, which started the broad corruption case. Her murder, the investigation of her murder, opened up just a Pandora's box of individuals involved in uh, not just murder, murder for hire, extortion, kidnapping, fraud, bribery. It just ran the gamut of basically all the felonies that you can think of. As Victor gets in deeper with the corrupt cops, they let him in on upcoming crimes. In February 1981, they discuss a murder for hire during a particular meeting, Julio brings up for the consideration of the group that he had been offered a contract to kill a journalist in the southern region of Puerto Rico. 
Julio suggests that Victor be the trigger man, perhaps to test his allegiance to the group. Agents can't let a murder happen, but they don't want to jeopardize the case by arresting anyone too early. It was finally decided that the best course of action was to contact the journalist directly, tell him that there was a threat on his life, that we were working on it, but that we needed him to be out of Puerto Rico and out of harm's way. The journalist disappears for a month. Which gave us enough time to then, through Victor, convince Julio and the rest of the group that killing a journalist was not a good idea. In fact, it was a stupid idea. And the amount of heat that it would bring down upon them and others would be untenable for them. And uh, they really should rethink this, this contract thing. And that's exactly what happened. Convinced that killing the journalist would bring too much publicity, Julio calls off the hit. Every word is recorded, helping to build the case. We had microphones inside Victor's car. So whenever anyone was in his vehicle, we also would record their conversations inside his vehicle. Despite months of investigation, agents are far from their ultimate goal, to arrest and convict every corrupt officer. Victor just didn't have access to all of the people that we needed to, to get information out of. There were still huge holes. We were just barely beginning. And for those of us who were involved, we knew this. This was a, we knew this was gonna be a, a long, long-term deal and we had no illusions that it was gonna be quickly resolved. One of the players Victor is not close to is Detective Alejo Del Monte, head of the CIC. Agents believe he is the most powerful man in the organization and the most untouchable. He was an extremely intelligent man. And as far as being an investigator was perhaps one of the best, if not the best, homicide investigator that they ever had in that police department. That was who he was. Still, agents vowed to dismantle the death squad from the foot soldiers all the way to the top. In Puerto Rico, the 1980 murder of Jessica Trujillo prompts an FBI investigation into a ring of crooked cops. As agents learn of alleged crimes, case agent Angelo Class holds off on making individual arrests. And there were so many people involved that it would have been good for that particular case, but it would have been detrimental to the overall objective, which was to identify as many people as we could that were involved in corruption in Puerto Rico. Special Agent Jim Bird. The other thing was, we still didn't have enough to make an arrest in the Jessica murder or in any of the other murders or other suspicious uh, activity that we thought could be tied back into police corruption. We just weren't there yet. Detective Victor Suse is turned informant against the death squad. In April 1981, he learns the group intends to rob the Puerto Rico Power Authority. As a diversion, they plan to detonate a bomb at the back of the complex, then storm the front office. The hit is scheduled for when the most cash is on hand, according to NIE Special Agent Manuela Ponte. They somehow had the insight that at that time there was going to be a lot of money there and wanted to go over there before the uh, armor cars come to pick up the money. Fearing that somebody was going to go in with guns blazing and, and take over this place, we had to intervene. But agents can't reveal their investigation. They have to use stealth for fear of tipping off the cops. They need to come up with a ruse. On the day the strike is to take place, Victor covertly contacts the FBI and tells them it's going down. Agents call the power authority and tell them about the bomb threat. As the death squad moves out, so do dozens of regular officers to search for a bomb. When they got there, um, uh, the place was crawling with cops, so they, uh, so they didn't pull it off. And so we'd won one victory on that one crime for at least we bought one day. 
After more than a year, agents have good cases on several members of the death squad. But they still have nothing on Alejo Del Monte, the gang's alleged leader. Then, Victor announces a big break. We were um, informed that uh, Julio Seis had, a, had invited Victor to travel down to Tucaguas, a nearby town, and meet with Alejo, which was a big breakthrough for us. We wanted Victor to, to try to get a recording of Alejo. Hopefully, they'd be talking about um, some kind of corrupt activity. From what I see here, Victor wants to record the meeting, but agents worry Alejo will find any wire. Victor had gotten so comfortable with wearing that body recorder that he actually fought us on it. He argued he wanted to wear the body recorder. And we won out. Basically, we just said, no, you're not going to wear this body recorder. In December 1981, Victor and Julio travel to Alejo's home. Though Victor cannot record the meeting, agents need him to witness Alejo discussing criminal acts. As predicted, Alejo is cautious of a wire and discreetly pats down Victor. What Alejo was trying to do was to find out a body recorder. Thankfully, this night, there is none. If he had been wearing the body recorder, he would have been found out that same night. Alejo takes Julio inside to talk in private. Victor and his handlers fear he's been made as an informant. The fear is verified on the way home. Went in their car back to, uh, to San Juan. He mentioned, you know what Alejo told me? That you may be working with the federal government. And that was uh, the first time that uh, we heard that uh, Victor had probably been made. Victor tries his best to convince Julio he can be trusted. But soon agents learn it didn't work. It was uh, around Christmas of 1981, and we had a wiretap ongoing. In one of the conversations we overheard, we learned that uh, plans were well developed to uh, have Victor murdered because they knew that he was cooperating with us. Investigators call Victor in to tell him it's over. And uh, I remember uh, Victor didn't want to come out. He wanted to keep on getting evidence against all these cops. We played that tape for him and he dropped his head and realized that it was all over, that he, he and his family were going to have to leave. Agents whisk Victor and his family out of Puerto Rico and into the witness protection program before the death squad can get to him. When Victor stops answering his phone, the rogue cops will surely know some sort of investigation is going on. They'll be less likely to talk and tougher to crack. Still, the investigation continues. We had, by this time, developed some additional sources within the police department uh, who maybe were not as prolific in terms of the information that they could provide like Victor could, but certainly they provided enough information that led us to actually conduct further investigations. Agents need real evidence against the most dangerous corrupt officer, Alejo Del Monte. We had this um, information about Alejo, not only by, by Victor, but by some other cops, that he was the coordinators of, uh, of these uh, crimes, especially committing uh, murder against rulers and contract to be, kill people. So um, Alejo was our target. So far, they have nothing solid against the leader Alejo, but they are about to get it. September 1st, 1982, two years into the investigation. Mario Ramirez is driving home after work from his father's jewelry store. He has no idea his world is about to come crashing down.
In September 1982, a group of armed men abduct Mario Ramirez in San Juan, Puerto Rico. night, Mario's father receives a call. The man on the line says they've kidnapped Mario for a $500,000 ransom. He says he'll call again with instructions, and they'll kill Mario if anyone calls the police. For hours, the family struggles with what to do. Then Mario's father calls his neighbor, FBI Special Agent Angelo Class. It just so happens that the victim and his father lived across the street from me and were personal friends of mine. Class comes over right away, sneaking in a back door. Hearing what happened, Class calls for additional agents and tells them to park on side streets and slip in unnoticed. We have to be careful because I suspected that the bad guys would be watching Mario's house. As the team gathers, they discuss the case. Earlier, a confidential source reported Alejo Del Monte planned to kidnap a jeweler's son. Special Agent Jim Bird teaches the family to extend future calls long enough for a trace and to elicit details of where Mario might be. We try to uh, coach them before the call comes in. Okay, next time he calls, what are you gonna say? What are we gonna do? What, what's the plan? What they don't tell the family is that if the death squad is responsible, Mario may never come home. We thought from the very beginning that uh, based on what we knew about the people involved, that Mario most likely was going to be killed, uh, that uh, whether they got the money or not. The chances that he would survive uh, this ordeal were not great. Over several days, calls come in recorded by the FBI. Stalling for time, Mario's father says he can't come up with all the money. The caller lowers the ransom to $224,000 in cash and jewelry. Mario's father tries to keep the man on the line, but the kidnapper knows exactly when to end each call. With traces impossible, agents search for other ways to find the kidnappers. We want to look for any kind of clue. Is there traffic in the background? Are there night noises of the, the Puerto Rican mountains in the background? We want to find out as much as we can about the situation by listening to these tapes over and over again. As they listen in, they come to a remarkable conclusion. The people that were reviewing the phone calls after we received them that knew Alejo personally said, that's Alejo's voice. They thought that was him on the phone. Agents set up covert surveillance of Alejo and the other corrupt cops. Alejo being a lieutenant colonel in the police department, he would know that he was being surveilled, so we, we had to do it very quietly. On the fourth night, a final call comes in. FBI Special Agent Fernando Candelario is listening in. An individual with a uh, unique voice was on the line. He was very specific as to where he wanted the family to drop the money off. He described a bridge off the uh, Caguas Expressway. The caller says the money and jewelry should be placed in a pillowcase and dropped into the grass by the bridge. The drop must be made in one hour. No cops, no FBI. We began a trace. That was unsuccessful at that point because the call was, was too short. Uh, this individual was pretty sharp. He uh, seemed to know exactly what he wanted to say and how long he wanted to take to say what he needed to say. Agents know the death squad has killed other kidnapped victims. But Mario's family prays that this time the ransom will be enough to save an innocent young man.
The FBI and Puerto Rico's NIE believe a gang of rogue cops known as the Death Squad have kidnapped Mario Ramirez. On September 4th, 1982, agents surveil the ransom drop site, a bridge outside San Juan, according to NIE Special Agent Manuel Aponte. Uh, we had a couple agents nearby that place, and they uh, sneaked down to that road far away and just stayed over there in the bushes. Mario's father heads to the site with the ransom protected by an armed agent hiding in his car. FBI Special Agent Fernando Candelario helps coordinate the rescue attempt. We had an aircraft in the air to assist. You'd be surprised how quiet the plane could be. Uh, this was at night. Uh, we could fly with lights out, so the kidnapper's not even gonna see the plane in the sky. Dozens of agents conduct ground surveillance, trying to remain invisible. With everyone in place, Mario's father makes the drop by the bridge as instructed. Agents now wait for the pickup. Soon the pilot spots a vehicle approaching. The plane observes the vehicle park near the bridge. An individual exits the vehicle. The individual apparently found what he needed to find, the package containing the money. Returned to his vehicle and drove away. Special Agent Jim Bird. At that point, the car is driving down the highway. We have a plane, we have ground units trying to follow uh, this individual who has the $224,000. We still don't know where the, the victim is. Special Agent Angelo Class has run the police corruption case for two years. We didn't know who the subjects or the people were inside the car. So we asked one of our agents to drive by it and take a quick look. So he drives by and he says, it's, you're not gonna believe this, he says on the radio. It's Alejo himself. As investigators watch from a distance, the leader, Alejo, switches to another car. The plane follows the original car. Ground agents trail Alejo. No one knows which car holds the ransom, but that's the least of their worries. The primary goal is to rescue the victim, even if we have to lose the ransom. When the vehicle starts moving, we don't want everybody behind the subject. You don't want to get so close that you're going to uh, burn the surveillance that may cause them to kill the victim. As Alejo pulls into his own neighborhood, agents decide not to let him get to a phone. We thought if we arrested Alejo, that the others wouldn't have a motive to kill Mario anymore because it would be Alejo to give the order to kill him. At the suspect's house, the agents move in. FBI, let me see your hands. Special Agent D. Rosario calls in a warning. Put your hands up. I got on the radio and I said, be careful. He always carries an Uzi. Ignoring agents' instructions, Alejo makes a move like he's going for a gun. An NIE agent fires a warning shot. But it went so close to his, his face that it actually popped his eardrum, and his ears started bleeding. Agents find no ransom in the car and no sign of Mario. A search of Alejo's house turns up no other evidence. Then, the surveillance plane loses contact with the other car. It seems a total loss. 
Well, we have a colonel from the police of Puerto Rico being arrested for kidnapping charges. We don't have a victim, and we don't have a ransom. Mario is still out there, somewhere. Agents try to get Alejo to crack and tell them where the victim is held. None of that happened. It was simply, you got the wrong guy. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a lieutenant colonel of the police of Puerto Rico. You've made a big mistake. Agents scramble to find any of the other suspects. We went up and down streets in Cagos and the suburbs looking for the cars we had identified with, with these uh, criminals. Hours pass. Hope begins to fade. And then... Mario was left on the side of the road uh, near San Juan. Uh, called his house from a public telephone booth and said, I've been released. And we picked him up and, and, and brought him back in. It seems that once Alejo was arrested, the other kidnappers got nervous and released Mario. Finally, he is home. I had never seen grown FBI agents cry. That's how emotional it got. And at that point, no one really cared whether we had recovered that ransom or not. Uh, it was important that we got him back. With Alejo in custody, it's time to take everyone else down. A federal judge returns indictments on 32 people, mostly corrupt officers. Agents quickly take them into custody. Homicide Chief Emeterio Benitez cooperates and finally tells investigators the details of Jessica Trujillo's murder, the crime that started it all. The drug lord she was to testify against paid $20,000 for the hit. According to Emeterio, he and Gil Barrera picked her up that night and decided to kill her on the way to her grandmother's house. As they were driving through the cane fields out there in that rural part of the island, without any warning, <clears throat> gunshot is fired. Heel shot her from the back seat. And a moment later, bam, another gunshot goes off. They stopped, took her out, threw her in the sugarcane field, and drove off. Later, Emeterio realized Jessica had playfully pinned his own police ID on her shirt. He went back and retrieved his ID, though he missed his Panama hat. Such an audacious murder, shooting a young girl wearing the chief's hat and ID in a police car shows how untouchable the death squad thought they were. This was done without any planning on, on who was gonna pull the trigger, or where it was gonna take place, or what were they gonna do with the body. He just shot her, driving in, in the head of Homicide's police vehicle. The two-year investigation is the biggest police corruption case in Puerto Rico's history. Most of the officers plead guilty, and all receive sentences ranging from eight years to life. It's reprehensible. What could be worse than somebody with a charge, an affirmative duty to protect citizenry, and they're out blowing their brains out for money? Today, the police of Puerto Rico is a different institution. The rebel CIC division has been disbanded, and the citizens of Puerto Rico can once again trust the men and women sworn to protect them. A series of explosions rip through New York City, sifting through the wreckage in search of one shred of evidence. The FBI and police are desperate for something to lead them to these ruthless terrorists. But the killers are careful to cover their tracks. As the bombings escalate, the FBI is in a deadly race to stop this murderous group with a dangerous cause.
70s and early 80s, a legitimate Puerto Rican independence movement took hold in the United States. But a splintered terrorist group known as the FALN was suspected of executing hundreds of bombings in major U.S. cities. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The terrorists were smart, well-organized, and deadly, and went to great lengths to conceal their identities. Agents were determined to shut them down before they hit again. New York City, October 26, 1974, just after midnight. Five explosions rock Manhattan. New York City police officers race to the scenes. The biggest explosion occurs in the financial district. NYPD detective Elmer Toro leads the investigation. One look at the devastation and Toro knows he will be lucky to find any useful evidence. It appears the bombers used dynamite. The problem with bombings is that most of the evidence disappears at the, at the scene. It disappears because uh, how do you trace dynamite? We have no way of tracing uh, dynamite. You, you can hope uh, for a fingerprint here and there. You can hope for a witness. Police question everyone in the area, but no one had seen the bomber. The pattern of debris indicates the bomb was placed under a car. It was put under the engine block and it picked up the car and the engine just flew up in the air. Pieces landed up all the way on the, up on the sixth floor. It was a pretty impressive uh, bombing. We did realize quickly that we had a serious problem in our hands. The only solid clue found at the scene is the tattered remains of what appears to be a leather luggage handle. While police continue to process the scene, they get a call from the Associated Press. One of the alleged bombers called the news agency and told them to look at a phone booth near the bomb site. The patrolman is dispatched to the location. There, under the phone, he finds a letter. He takes it to headquarters to study it for leads. The letter is from a group calling themselves the FALN. In Spanish, the initials stand for the Armed Forces for the National Liberation of Puerto Rico. They are a fringe group with a limited following. The FALN is not even known in Puerto Rico. It's known to the radical, it's known to those fighting for independence, but in general, you speak to the average Puerto Rican and the FLN is totally unknown to them. The former Spanish colony of Puerto Rico is voluntarily part of the United States. In elections, more than 90% of Puerto Ricans vote to continue to be part of the US, while less than 5% vote for independence. Now that 5% has turned dangerous. In the letter, the FALN demands that the U.S. abandon Puerto Rico or more bombs will explode. These are not people that believe in the electoral system. Their objective is to be violent and through fear cause the people to support them. What began as a bombing investigation is now a terrorist attack. And fighting terrorism is the job of the FBI. The NYPD goes to the Bureau. Detective Toro briefs FBI Special Agent Don Wolford on the evidence found at the bombing locations. The evidence showed that the device was a dynamite-like high explosive, definitely set off by some kind of detonator because that was, that's the only thing that sets off the sticks of dynamite. There were plenty of pieces to show a watch had been used as the timing device, and plenty of pieces of a battery showing that the battery had been used to complete the circuit. Pieces of debris shown that this device was in some kind of bag. Several pieces of a handle were found. It's not much to go on, but it's all the investigators have. They try to find out who made the handle. Perhaps they can use the information to learn who bought it. They then turn their attention to the communique it demands the U.S. abandon Puerto Rico 
and release five Puerto Rican terrorists from federal prison. The terrorists have been in prison since the 1950s. Decades earlier, on November 1st, 1950, two Puerto Rican gunmen try to assassinate President Harry Truman and fail. Two Washington, D.C. policemen are badly injured in the gun battle. One policeman, as well as one of the terrorists, dies. The surviving gunman is sentenced to life in prison. Three years later, four more pro-independence Puerto Ricans are sent to prison after opening fire in the House of Representatives. Now Detective Toro and Agent Wolford theorize friends or family of the five may be behind this new terror group. I was hopeful that working on the background and the current status, maybe, of those five political prisoners would be some kind of lead. So we went behind each of those people. We checked their mailing list. We checked their people who visited them. At the same time, the NYPD and FBI monitor any Puerto Rican activists who have a history of promoting violence. One month after the bombing, the NYPD gets a call about a dead body in an abandoned building in Spanish Harlem. Rookie NYPD officer Angel Poggi, on his first day on the job, goes to investigate. Officer Poggi is of Puerto Rican descent and proud to have become one of New York City's finest. The door was booby-trapped, and he blasted him right across the street and ended his career on the spot. Although Officer Poggi survived the blast, he lost sight in his right eye. When police search the building, they find no dead body. The phone call was a lie to lure police into a deadly trap. The bomb squad recovers explosive residue and another luggage handle. Like the earlier bombing, they determined this bomb was made of dynamite. From the pattern of the blast damage, they suspect it was probably hung on the back of the door, possibly in a garment bag. Through another phone tip, police recover an FALN communique that proudly claims credit for bombing officer Poggi. For the NYPD, this investigation has become personal. They're fighting for Puerto Rican independence, and the, the first cop they mutilate is a Puerto Rican kid, a Puerto Rican kid, because that's all he was. When they get to your house, you sort of react a little bit different. We knew we had a war in our hands. The communique says the bombing is revenge for the death of an obscure Puerto Rican poet, Martin Tito Perez. If you had put Martin Tito Perez's name out in Spanish Harlem, probably a lot of people might have known who he was. But in the rest of Manhattan and in the rest of the United States, of course, nobody would have known who Martin Tito Perez was, except the bomber knew. At this point, we knew we had a Spanish Harlem connection. A few days earlier, police photographed a Puerto Rican man in Spanish Harlem, handing out leaflets accusing the police of murdering Martin Perez in jail. Although Perez's death was officially ruled a suicide, the activist urges violent revenge against the police. His name is William Morales. William Morales was a very activist person in Spanish Harlem. He was one of the Puerto Rican independence type people who were at any demonstration, any rally or whatever. He was a, a player in the Puerto Rican independence movement. While Morales seems suspicious, police don't have enough to bring him in. They continue their search for anyone who knows anything about the crippling attack on Officer Poggi, but come up empty. While the investigation stalls, the FALN set their sights on a historic tavern in the heart of New York's financial district. The terrorists are raising the stakes for their deadly cause. The terrorist group called the FALN detonates a series of bombs all over New York City. 
The FBI struggles to piece together the evidence in time to stop the bombers before they strike again. They are fighting a losing battle. Historic Francis Tavern in the financial district is a popular lunch spot for Wall Street brokers. On January 24th, a bomb explodes during the lunch rush. The blast kills four people and injures more than 60. The victims are rushed to area hospitals. FBI Special Agent Don Wolford. It's one of the worst explosive crime scenes I've seen in uh, my uh, era career. The entire first floor was nothing but splinters. All of the tables and chairs and walls and everything was just splinters. Okay, look up here. The first Six. bombs did not kill anyone. The second targeted a single individual. This time, the bombers clearly intended to kill as many people as possible. This was a midday bomb, not 3 o'clock in the morning, not a bomb hung in an abandoned tenement, but a bomb put in an active restaurant full of people. It is a scene that FBI Special Agent Rick Hahn will never forget. The streets were wet, having been hosed down to hose off the blood and, and uh, damage to the individuals that had been injured or died at the scene. Seeing that scene impacted me in such a way that I really wanted to make sure that we solved those cases. At the site of the blast, investigators again find a luggage handle similar to the one found at the earlier bombings. Independently, witnesses tell them that a few minutes before the bomb exploded, a suspicious man left a garment bag. He's not dressed to be in Francis Tavern Restaurant with, with Wall Street brokers at noon. He must have taken a wrong turn, and why is he leaving that bag? Didn't reach down and turn on any switches, according to all the witnesses. He just dropped it. So that bomb was ticking. That thing was going. And based on the damage it did, it probably had 20 to 30 sticks of dynamite in it. So there's a man walking around Manhattan with a bomb with 20 or 30 sticks of dynamite in it. That takes some dedication. And uh, his hair was part of Witnesses work with a police artist to develop sketches of the suspect. This group was clearly becoming more dangerous and the FBI intensifies their efforts. Look, I got this sketch on. The FBI distributes the sketch all over New York. But investigators can't find anyone who matches the description. So on these levels... In the lab, technicians review what little physical evidence they have. They turn to the letters left at each of the sites outlining the terrorist group demands. Their objective was to kill executives from U.S. corporations, and they say that right in the communique. Corporate America is seen in those days as part of the military-industrial complex, and as such, attacking U.S. corporations is as good as ta attacking the U.S. government. Right here. Lab technicians confirm that all three FALN communiques use the same paper, typeface, and letterhead. It's not much to go on. We found out, to our chagrin, that the complete communique, the paper, the ink, the font, the type, the stencil, the logo, and everything could be bought at a million different places in Manhattan. I think you already know. The luggage handles do provide lab technicians with a promising lead. The garment bags used to hide the bombs are all one particular model made by one manufacturer. It could be the break the investigators need. The FBI contacts the manufacturer for a list of every store in the New York area that carries the bags. Over the next few weeks, investigators visit each store and show the sketch. But no one seems to recognize the suspect. The bombings continue. Three months after the Francis Tavern bombing, an FALN communique takes credit for four bombs that explode after midnight in midtown Manhattan. Then, 800 miles away in Chicago, the unimaginable happens. Bombs explode at two banks. 
and FALN communique takes credit. The terrorists are now a nationwide threat. In the New York FBI office, investigators compare the Chicago communique with earlier FALN communiques. We know immediately when we get the communique from the masthead being the same, from the logo being the same, that this is in fact our FALN. This gives investigators new angles to pursue. There's a whole new theory that arises from that, and that is that we can't find them in New York because they're really a Chicago-based group. The FBI contacts Special Agent William Dyson in the Chicago field office. This is the first time Chicago is being involved in this group called the FALN. New York has a very large Puerto Rican population and appeared as though these attacks were going to be strictly in New York. Now Chicago comes new on the scene. So we we're really not sure what to do. We're turning to New York saying, do you have any leads? Can you give us a hint? Where do we go? Somehow the FALN must communicate or travel between New York and Chicago. The FBI and police begin rechecking their list of potential suspects. We can look at our New York people and see what kind of Chicago connections they have. Do they travel it to Chicago at all? Do they, in turn, have visitors from Chicago? Is, is the travel the reverse? Are we, do we see Chicago people in New York, and then do we have a bombing? Investigators determined that several of the Puerto Rican activists they had been watching in New York have links to Chicago. We had all of our people that we thought were interested under 24-hour surveillance. And by that, I mean we were sticking with them wherever they went. I would spend weeks and weeks on the street. We just couldn't get to the next level. Their surveillance is not working, and the terror continues. Nine months after the Francis Tavern bombing, bombs again explode in New York. This time, the bombs also tear through the financial centers of Chicago and Washington, D.C. Once again, the FALN takes credit. After the attack, law enforcement in Chicago and corporate security guards respond by searching around their buildings. Outside the corporate headquarters of an oil company, guards discover a suspicious bouquet of flowers linked to FALN. And they find 14 roses, high quality roses, like you would give uh, for Mother's Day or something of that nature. Within these roses is this bomb. The Chicago police bomb tech defuses the bomb. Now, for the first time, investigators will have the opportunity to examine an unexploded FALN bomb, which could provide critical leads. A crime lab technician reads the unique identification numbers on the sticks of dynamite. It is traced to a dam project in New Mexico, but the trail stops there. No dynamite was reported stolen. When that lead proves to be a dead end, investigators try to trace the bouquet of roses. We've got to go to the florist. Well, it turns out there's something like 800 florists in the Chicago area. We went to every one of them. When I say we, I mean law enforcement. It wasn't just the FBI. We all got together, and we all divided up all the florist shops, and we went to every one of them. Could not find where those roses came from. Back in New York, the FBI realizes the components of this bomb match the other bombs. Investigators compile lists of all the stores in the New York City area that sell each of the items. They find one store that sells everything. We identify a store up in the Bronx that sells the particular types of watches that have been used, that sells the propane tanks. More importantly, it sells the types of bags that have been used to contain the bombs. The FBI theorizes that maybe the bombers got sloppy and bought everything at the same store. At the store, investigators show the owner the composite sketch. Couldn't say by name who the person was, but that a person similar in appearance to that person had been at this store, definitely buying a whole series of the bags and a whole series of the batteries. Investigators believe this could be a major break. 
they show the store owner photos of possible suspects. She can't positively ID any of them. But she does agree to help. We did solicit the cooperation of the owner of the store. She allowed us to go in and mark discreetly the bags, the watches, those sorts of things, to see whether or not they would be used in a device. These marks might survive the blast and could confirm the items were purchased from her store. Investigators also established round-the-clock surveillance. And when a person uh, bought a bag, we would put a surveillance on that individual and try to identify who this individual was and try to match uh, the composite to the purchaser of the bag. Now the agents will have to wait and see if the terrorists walk into their trap. In New York, a terrorist group called the FALN plants a series of bombs, killing four people and injuring more than 60. Now they've expanded their terror spree to other American cities, including Washington, D.C. and Chicago. The FBI has been struggling to get a lead on the group. They learn that items similar to those used to make the bombs are all sold in a store in the Bronx. Agents set up surveillance. But after months of watching the store, they find nothing. Perhaps the terrorists have already stockpiled supplies. Or perhaps they have spotted their surveillance and are once again one step ahead of investigators. Months after the most recent bombing, the case takes a bizarre twist in Chicago. The police there get an odd tip. An informant reports that a man at a garage has been trying to sell sticks of dynamite to street gangs. The responding officer hears hammering and sees a man trying to break open a trunk. Hey, stand up, put the hammer down now. The officer also spots dynamite. Put your hands up where I can see him. The man says his friend stole it from an apartment that contains even more explosives. The FBI rushes to the apartment. Inside, they find more than a hundred sticks of dynamite and other bomb-making materials. FBI Special Agent William Dyson. So we not only have explosives, but we also have propane tanks. We have a lot of drilled out wristwatches. We even have communiques. Investigators feel confident they have discovered an FALN bomb factory. We definitely have the FALN, there's no question about it. The problem is, who are the people connected with this apartment? While the bomb squad renders the building safe, investigators question tenants who say no one lives in the apartment. They say they have seen two people going in and out, the building's owner, Carlos Torres, and his wife. One of the things that struck us right away was this lack of sophistication here. The idea of having a bomb factory in your own building, the idea of you being the landlord of the building, the person who would have the access to all the vacant apartments, who would have the keys, just is plain stupid. So now we got two suspects, obviously, because not only do they own the building, but residents say they have access. They've seen them up in this apartment. Investigators search for Carlos Torres, the building's owner, and his wife, Haiti. But they have vanished, which reinforces investigators' belief that they have finally identified members of the FALN. The FBI systematically hunts for the bomb factory fugitives. They begin with a thorough background investigation. We pretty much follow the normal fugitive procedures, and that basically is to try to make a biography on each one of these individuals. Who are they? Where did they come from? Who are all their relatives? Make a family tree. We make a family tree on these people better than they would make one. We try to find out every person that's related to them in one way, shape, or form. Agents interview and watch all of their known relatives and friends but the fugitives have disappeared without a trace. At the same time, the FBI focuses on an odd document found in the bomb factory. 
It seems all the Chicago FALN suspects belong to the same Latino church committee. The Chicago FBI notifies New York. FBI Special Agent Rick Hahn. There was a suspicion that the FALN had co-opted this organization, this charitable organization, for its own purposes, to use it for travel, to use it for uh, funding. FBI Special Agent Don Wolford reviews records that show the Chicago suspects used church-paid tickets to fly to New York before several past bombings. There's lots of travel back and forth financed by the organization because ostensibly it is supposed to be lending and giving grants for people to start neighborhood community type Hispanic activities like uh, Spanish Bibles and hymnals maybe for a church in a, in a Hispanic neighborhood, that kind of thing. Investigators also discovered that the church committee includes a familiar face, New York pro-violence radical William Morales. They keep a close watch on Morales and all the members of the church committee. But investigators don't see anything suspicious. They don't have enough probable cause to request wiretaps or search warrants. We've taken a lot of heat. You know, a lot of people were asking, what are you guys doing? You know, these people keep, keep, keep on blowing up all these, what are you guys doing? Six months later, at the Mobile Oil Building near Grand Central Station, a bomb in an employment office kills one person and injures eight. She came in, she put the umbrella on her. The FBI and NYPD arrive and question witnesses. A woman who takes job applications claims she saw the bomber. She was, you know, I know who left that bomb because I saw her and I talked to her and I cannot believe she, a little girl, she kept saying, a little girl like that would leave that, would leave a bomb in here and blow somebody up. But I saw her and that's who left it. The witness says a woman came in carrying a closed umbrella that seemed unusually heavy. She knew when she hung that device there, when it went off, somebody was gonna get hurt. The suspect took a job application. She scratched quick a name and, a, and an address. The bomb is clicking right next to her. She wants to get out of there fast. The suspect tried to leave, but the woman wouldn't let her take the application with her. Minutes later, the bomb went off, decapitating the man next to it. Because he absorbed most of the blast, no one else was killed. I do know that I could recognize her because I saw her. Investigators ask for the application, hoping the suspect left a fingerprint. If they could find a print, it would be their first piece of solid evidence to the identity of the bombers. The lab uncovers nothing on the front of the application. But on the back, they find what they had been looking for, a single fingerprint. The fingerprint belongs to Haiti Torres, the wife of Carlos Torres, who owned the recently discovered FALN bomb factory in Chicago. New York City police issue a warrant for her arrest for second degree murder. After a grand jury indictment, her husband Carlos is added to the FBI's top 10 fugitive list. Now that agents have identified their suspects, they must hope for a break that will uncover where the fugitives are hiding before they strike again. A terror group called the FALN plants bombs in major cities around the country, including New York and Chicago, killing five people and injuring more than 80. In New York, the FBI suspects that William Morales, a pro-violence radical, is somehow connected to the group. But after months of surveillance, investigators haven't seen anything suspicious. The FBI finally asks Morales if he will talk with them. Surprisingly, he agrees. 
Okay. FBI Special Agent Don Wolford watches through a one-way mirror as Detective Elmer Toro questions Morales about the FALN terrorist group. But he gives them nothing. Cool, collected, not the least bit uh, upset, not intimidated whatsoever. I don't know nothing about nothing about nothing. Investigators watch for clues to try and determine if it is just an act. My position was, he's a player. He's definitely a player. Maybe he is a minor league player and he doesn't know anything. I don't believe it, but maybe. But he's a player. Investigators continue to suspect Morales. But without more evidence, there are legal limits to how far they can go. Two months later, Queens, New York. Firefighters respond to an explosion in an apartment and find FALN letterhead. FBI agent Wolford arrives just as paramedics take a badly injured man from the apartment. Agent Wolford believes the man may be an FALN suspect and tries to identify him. But the man's face is badly injured and his hands are nearly blown off. Inside the bare apartment, investigators find three small pipe bombs. Evidence suggests a fourth pipe bomb exploded while being built, which explains how the man injured his hands. Investigators discover a copying machine and papers printed with the FALN logo. They also find a large stockpile of explosives. Detective Elmer Toro goes to the hospital to try to identify the suspected bomb maker. The man's hands are so badly injured that police are unable to get fingerprints. Detective Toro tells the man that investigators will learn his identity from evidence at the bomb factory. You can see this. He might as well admit his name now. But the man can't speak. Manuel Rodrigo. I wrote a bunch of names, uh, people that I suspected. Once we got to the name of William Morales, he moved and his, he agreed without saying who he was. But he basically identified himself. Detective Toro believes they may have captured the FALN's bomb maker. Toro grills him for information about the organization. But Morales refuses to cooperate. Nine months later, Morales goes on trial for reckless endangerment and possession of dangerous weapons. Well, Morales didn't fight. Morales claimed a prisoner of war status, no defense, uh, which is a dream for the prosecution. The judge sentences him to 89 years. Police take Morales to the jail ward of Bellevue Hospital to be fitted with artificial hands before going to prison. Incredibly, despite police guards in the hallway, he manages to escape. Investigators rush to Morales's hospital room. My initial reaction was, this is just a bad joke. You know, this is just a bad, yeah, right, sure, sure he's escaped. How could he escape? First off, he's physically unable to escape. And secondly, he's up on the third floor. They find the window bars and mesh cut open. The mesh had been spread apart, not more than six to eight inches, just about like this. So he had to squeeze through that hole and get out of the mesh. And then how did he get down three floors? And of course, coming to mind immediately was he had help. Investigators begin to piece together what happened. Someone must have smuggled in a pair of bolt cutters. William Morales cut himself out from the third floor with his elbows, he just, because he had no hands. Investigators believe Morales jumped three floors to the ground where waiting accomplices drove him away. The FBI and NYPD launch an all-out manhunt for Morales and alert the public and police across the country to be on the lookout. But months go by and the manhunt turns up nothing. Then the terrorists strike again. 
Six months after Morales' escape, the FALN begins bombing again in New York, Chicago, and San Juan, Puerto Rico. One year after William Morales' escape, just north of Chicago, Evanston police respond to reports of an illegally parked van. They radio in the license, which comes back stolen. Police decide to watch the stolen van to see if anyone comes back. So they surveil it. I mean, they could have towed it away, but they surveil it. A short while later, a man and woman drive up to the van and begin loading it. Put your hands up! Let me see your hands! Let me see your hands! Turn around! Face away from me! Stay right where Police you are! Police confront the two and find rifles. The suspects have no ID and refuse to speak, leaving police at a loss. Where do weapons come from? They can't even figure out what nationality they are. So they bring him in, so they got those two people. A few hours later, in the same Chicago suburb, a citizen calls Evanston police to complain about a truck parked in a wealthy neighborhood. The woman says people have been coming up to the truck and climbing in the back all morning. A police officer comes out and tries to talk to the driver. What are y'all doing here in the neighborhood? Why are you here? Well, I'm visiting. Who are you visiting? I'm visiting that person over there. Well, who is that person? Well, I don't know his name and all that and press vague type of descriptions. It all seems very suspicious. The officer glances into the truck and spots the butt of a handgun. Now he knows he's dealing with armed suspects, and there may be more of them hiding in the back of the truck. Step out of the vehicle, sir. Amid a rash of terror bombings, officers in Evanston, Illinois, arrest a suspicious couple. In the back of their truck, police find people with shotguns, handguns, and disguises. Officers arrest them as well. Evanston police photograph and fingerprint their prisoners. No, I've got the list. Can you run it they also check their identification, but they run into a problem. The names on their IDs prove to be false. Detectives try to interview the suspects, but they refuse to talk. Sensing they are onto something big, the police call the FBI. FBI Special Agent William Dyson looks at the prisoners and immediately recognizes one as a major FALN terrorist. I've got his wanted post, a top 10 fugitive, and I recognize him. I mean, this is Carlos Torres. Agent Dyson also recognizes other prisoners as members of the FALN. It was like looking at this collage that I had above my desk in the office of all these wanted people. So we have the FALN. We know we have the FALN. We're able to identify enough of them. This is the FALN. The FBI takes a closer look at the false IDs. From past experience, the FBI knows that criminals who use fake ID often include a real address so that it can be used to function in society. Agents notice that several of the IDs have the same Chicago address. The FBI and Chicago police raid that address and find bomb-making materials and more FALN evidence. With information from the captured terrorists, agents raid addresses in Milwaukee, New York, and New Jersey. They take down more FALN safe houses. Six years after the bombings began, a federal jury finds the captured FALN terrorists guilty of seditious conspiracy, weapons violations, interstate transportation of stolen vehicles, and other charges. But notorious FALN's suspected leader, William Morales, still remains a fugitive. A group of 
Just before sentencing, one FALN member decides to cooperate in exchange for a reduced sentence. He says the 11 terrorists were in Evanston to rob an armored car to finance more bombings. He also describes a meeting at a Milwaukee safe house. They had this meeting in which they plot this thing out. And the man leading the meeting, he's got a mask on, so you can't recognize him. But he's got no hands. So immediately, everybody knew it was William Morales. Fanatical FALN leader William Morales' hands were maimed years earlier while making a bomb. Investigators press for more information, but the cooperating FALN member doesn't know how to find Morales. Agents try a different approach and question their informant about how the FALN recruits members. We have to know how they bring new people into the group. Once we know that, then we can go after them. Investigators learn that the FALN recruits from the ranks of Puerto Rican radicals. Anyone who joins must drop all political activities in order to maintain a low profile. With that pattern in mind, FBI Special Agent Rick Hahn searches through hundreds of files on Puerto Rican radicals. It's a long shot attempt to identify the remaining FALN terrorists. We looked for individuals that had stopped attending rallies and things like that, that had made themselves uh, quite well known prior to that time. And we focused on them for surveillances. More than a year passes before the FBI finally finds one suspect who seems to lead a double life. Very, very quickly, we realize this guy's clandestine. He's doing things that's not normal. Agents track the suspect to an FALN safe house. Based on the suspect's behavior, the FBI gets a court order allowing listening devices and wiretaps. In March 1983, two years after first gaining cooperation from the FALN informant, the FBI gets a break. Through a wiretap, they overhear a suspected FALN member on the phone asking a mysterious man in Mexico to come to Chicago. He refused to come up and said, basically, why don't you come visit me? Uh, I'm having plastic surgery done. Uh, I'm in need of uh, good identification. I can't come into the country. Uh, I'll be too easily recognized, that sort of thing. The mysterious man says to call the same number in a week. In a huge break, investigators identify the mystery voice as that of the FALN's fugitive leader. By his voice, we were pretty sure that it was probably William Morales. It's the first time the FBI has heard Morales' voice since his bold escape from New York police custody four years earlier. The FBI traces terrorist leader William Morales' phone call to a cafe in Puebla, Mexico. Back in Chicago, the FBI is stuck. They have no jurisdiction in Mexico. Agents plan to continue listening to their wiretap and arrest Morales when he makes his plan to come back to America. But since Morales may have had plastic surgery and significantly changed his appearance, agents ask Mexican federales to secretly photograph him. FBI Special Agent Rick Hahn. The federales went down to that coffee shop and found Morales seated at a table there. Morales had severely maimed his hands years earlier while making a bomb. He cannot protect himself or fire a gun. The FBI warns the federales he is probably accompanied by an armed bodyguard. FBI Special Agent Don Wolford. We told him these guys got backup, you know, watch it. You just can't walk up with this guy and say, you're in the car. The federales don't see a bodyguard and decide to make the arrest themselves. NYPD Detective Elmer Toro. They were not supposed to take him down. They were supposed to take photographs. And they decided to make the arrest. And uh, William Morales, like a nice trained terrorist, he simply gave up and uh, provided the opportunity for his bodyguard 
to step out of the restaurant the bodyguard opens fire shooting both federales one of them critically the other federale returns fire killing the bodyguard He takes Morales into custody, but his arrest comes at a great price. The wounded Federale dies on the way to the hospital. New York police detective Elmer Toro immediately flies down to Mexico to interview Morales and try to arrange his return. Morales being in police custody and uh, having killed a police officer, I'm sure was subject to some degree of torture by the fe federales down there. Morales greets Detective Toro like a long lost friend. He was happy to see me. And he said to me, and I always remember, he says, uh, Elmer, I want to go back with you. Take me with you. Detective Toro says he'll draw up the papers, and Morales promises to sign. Just take me with you. Okay, with you. Once Mexican police learn that Morales is going back to the U.S., they treat him better to avoid a possible scandal. Back at his hotel, Detective Toro calls the FBI with the incredible news about Morales. Getting anything done in Mexico is just like, uh, forget it. But now he's talking about, I want to come back. And you know, we're all saying, thank you, Lord. All right. Let him come back. But it's not that simple. All of a sudden, I put the six o'clock news, and there is the bastard denouncing us. Morales appears on TV, flanked by radical lawyers from Cuba, the US, and Mexico. He now angrily condemns America. By this time, he's got a battery of attorneys from all over the place. He had people from Cuba, the attorneys from Cuba, very powerful attorneys. And once he was protected by these attorneys, he didn't need Elmer Toro anymore. He didn't want to come back anymore. Detective Toro now realizes that Morales used him to gain better treatment in jail while waiting for his lawyers to arrive. In the months to come, Cuba uses its influence and money to win the release of Morales. He's on the beach in Cuba, in Cienfuegos, Cuba, I believe. Sooner or later, Fidel Castro's government is going to go, and maybe we'll see Morales at that point. With Morales in permanent exile and other key members in prison, the FALN's eight-year reign of terror comes to an end. The FBI and police, through dedicated investigative work and patient long-term surveillance, have defeated one of the most deadly domestic terror groups in U.S. history. In Puerto Rico, violent militants murder a policeman, then turn their guns on a busload of unarmed Navy workers, and open fire on American sailors in the street. These ruthless killers have vowed to fight to the death. And the FBI must use every tactic at their disposal to track down the terrorists and end this rebellion in paradise. extremists waged a guerrilla war against the United States. Their goal to make the island an independent nation or die trying. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In 1983, the investigation became personal for agents when terrorists attacked their offices in San Juan. For the FBI, catching the perpetrators would depend on skill, patience, and turning a handful of small clues into one big break.
The Caribbean island of Puerto Rico is home to three million American citizens and a handful of anti-American terrorists. On August 24th, 1978, two Puerto Rican patrolmen encounter what appears to be a stranded couple. They stop to help. Suddenly, three heavily armed men rush them. One patrolman tries to draw his gun, but he's immediately shot and killed. The other patrolman surrenders. The attackers force him into the woods and order him to remove his uniform. Then bind him to a tree with his own handcuffs. Back at the road, the couple attempts to disguise the patrol car so they can drive it to a hiding place. But before they can finish, headlights approach. The man holds up the dead officer's badge. He tells the men in the car to move along. It's a police matter. But the men in the car identify themselves as undercover cops and offer to help. The man urges them to leave. Instead, they grow suspicious. At a safe distance, the cops pull off and radio for backup. They arm themselves and head back to take on their attackers. But when the cops arrive, they see no one. Wary of an ambush, they secure the crime scene. After searching the area, they rescue the handcuffed patrolman and find his partner's body. Five days later, a previously unknown terror group claims credit for the assault. Since the attack was claimed by a terrorist organization, the investigation falls under the jurisdiction of the FBI at the federal building in San Juan. Agents study the group's letter to the media, which includes diagrams allegedly showing what occurred. The group claims the patrolman overreacted, forcing them to kill him in self-defense. FBI Special Agent Rick Hahn. We thought it was very odd that they claimed credit for this incident, particularly since a police officer was killed. But the uh, communique was detailed and, in fact, included a graphic drawing of uh, the events as they claimed that they had occurred. And I think that they felt like they had to justify the fact that the officer had been killed. This new terror group calls themselves the People's Puerto Rican Army, or EPB in Spanish. Their stated goal is to turn the U.S. Commonwealth into an independent communist country, which is contrary to what the vast majority of Puerto Ricans want. Those who wanted total independence were less than 5% of the island. So the representative uh, numbers amongst the population uh, that are in, in sync with the terrorists is a very small handful of people. The letterhead includes the group's nickname, Machiteros. Machiteros actually comes from uh, the machete workers, the, the uh, blue-collar people, basically, of the island, uh, who they're claiming to represent. I think that they chose that name primarily to identify themselves with the unskilled laborers, the workers of Puerto Rico, the native people who would have been subjugated into things like chopping sugar cane. Agent Hahn reviews the evidence so far. Police recovered empty 9mm shells, but no useful fingerprints or fibers. Sketches of the suspects proved to be too general to be of much use. With no real leads to go on, the FBI decides to watch several militants who preach violence, hoping they will lead them to the Macheteros. The police take a different approach, encouraging informants to infiltrate militant groups. Well, the police of Puerto Rico, having lost one of their own, are extremely uh, focused on trying to resolve this. And they are recruiting young people and putting them into what they consider to be uh, radical organizations on college campuses. 
to try and ferret out who may be part of the Mach Terrors. Two months pass as the FBI and police continue to search for leads. Then, in October 1979, the Macheteros strike again at the U.S. Customs Building in San Juan. A high-powered bomb explodes. Fortunately, no one is injured. The symbolism of the Custom House is that it uh, represents the U.S. government's presence there in Puerto Rico. Everything that uh, comes imported into the island comes through the Customs House. In a letter to the media, the Macheteros take credit. In response, the FBI and police intensify their efforts. A month and a half later, at the Zabana Seca Navy base near San Juan, 18 unarmed Navy personnel ride a bus on a routine trip to work. A vehicle stops ahead, blocking their path. A van pulls out and begins firing on the bus with automatic weapons. They fired right along the black band on a typical school bus, which is right about, about where the floor level is, so that uh, even individuals that would be hiding on the floor to try and uh, get cover would have taken rounds through the side of the bus. The attack kills two people and wounds nine. Agent Hahn coordinates the investigation. This attack was so audacious and so brutal that it clearly upped the ante in terms of uh, what the terrorists were willing to do to the government personnel on the island. This was the first out and out planned homicide and that's clearly what this was. So it clearly upped the ante. Agents collect shell casings. They run the VIN number on the abandoned vehicle and find that it was stolen months earlier. They also check for fingerprints and fibers, but find none. The attackers have left no clues. The media receives a letter from the Macheteros proudly claiming credit. At the FBI lab in San Juan, technicians study the shell casings from the Navy bus shooting. They determined that the majority came from a 45 caliber Thompson submachine gun. The others came from a 223 caliber rifle. Technicians compare the unique markings on the shells to those used in other crimes, but can't find a match. Once again, agents have no real leads. Determined to track down the Macheteros, the FBI brings in dozens of additional agents from the mainland. The additional manpower makes it possible to put intense surveillance on militants believed to be linked to the Macheteros. It's only by watching them, watching their activities, and determining exactly what they're up to on a daily basis that we're going to be able to ferret out who's really a terrorist and who's somebody that's just talking. While the FBI tries to find the Macheteros, the Macheteros have already begun targeting the FBI. In Puerto Rico, a terror group known as the Macheteros murder a policeman and attack a bus full of unarmed Navy workers, killing two and wounding nine. With no real leads, the FBI takes a different approach. They decide to follow the money and try to determine how the terrorists get their funding. They spot a potential lead. A recent wave of armored car robberies the highly organized robbers carry high-powered weapons, grab the money, and flee. The robbers leave behind no evidence. FBI Special Agent Fernando Candelario. Abandoned vehicles that were recovered, we would trace to a name which turned out to be a fictitious name, and then it, it just got to a dead end. Agents suspect that the Macheteros committed the robberies but the crimes themselves provide no new leads. A month later, the Macheteros send a letter to the media claiming credit for a single $300,000 heist, though the FBI suspects they have committed many more. Through informants, the FBI begins hearing rumors that the Macheteros are led by a major Puerto Rican terrorist, Filiberto Ojeda. During the 1960s, Ojeda trained in Cuba as a communist agent. 
He returned to Puerto Rico and was arrested in 1970 for bombing tourist hotels. But he jumped bail and went into hiding. The FBI has been looking for him for the past 10 years. FBI Special Agent Rick Hahn. He was the sort of individual who we thought was very capable of putting together an organization like the Macheteros. If Ojeda leads the Macheteros, it helps explain their deadly discipline. The FBI increases its surveillance of militants suspected of having contact with Ojeda. Eight months later, while en route to a surveillance assignment, Agent Candelario hears on the radio that jet fighters have exploded at the Puerto Rican Air National Guard base. He heads straight for the base and is shocked by what he sees. It looked like a war zone. Some of the agents that were Vietnam veterans uh, were telling me how this reminded them of a, of a combat zone. The explosions destroyed nine fighter jets and disabled two more. The damage is estimated at $45 million. Miraculously, no one was injured in the attack. Agents searched the airbase for evidence. They find a machete painted with the letters EPB, an abbreviation of the formal name of the Macheteros. Agents believe the group left it behind as a calling card to taunt the FBI. Investigators determined that pipe bombs were placed in the jet's air intakes, exhaust pipes, and landing gear. They study pieces of the bombs, but gain no new leads. We interviewed every member of the Air National Guard to determine if this was an inside job. But the investigators conclude that no one from the base was aiding the Macheteros. For agents, it is another dead end. For many, many years, we've just collected a lot of evidence on the Macheteros, but we could not penetrate that organization. Days later, sailors from the USS Pensacola take in the tourist attractions of San Juan, just as they're about to cross a bridge. Bullets rip through all four sailors. One is killed and three seriously injured. In a phone call to a radio station, the Macheteros take credit. When I arrived to the scene, uh, the young soldier or sailor was still uh, laying there. My first reaction is, you know, I'm, is thinking about the parents of that young sailor. He's here in Puerto Rico, he's unarmed, has nothing to do with the political situation in Puerto Rico, but he's a U.S. military, and that's the targets that the Macheteros selected. Uh, and it was just a tragic situation. At the FBI lab, a technician examines the unique ejector marks on the empty shelves. It was determined that the weapon that was used was the 45 caliber uh, machine gun that was used in Savannah Seca. Agents have connected the weapon to at least two attacks, but are no closer to identifying members of the Macheteros. Devil's Night, the evening before Halloween. At 7.45 p.m., an event occurs that forever changes the FBI's attitude toward the Macheteros. A huge explosion rocks the FBI's office. FBI Special Agent Jose Rodriguez. The explosion was so loud that they suspected that it was a bomb inside the building. Because I, I was a bomb technician, I was one of the first people called. Surveying the scene, Agent Rodriguez notices that the window glass has been blown in, not out. That means that the explosion must have happened outside. He searches near the building for evidence. I started looking around, and I was able to find the uh, rocket motor cover with the fins intact in the back parking lot. He recognizes the object as part of an American law rocket, short for light anti-tank weapon. Agent Rodriguez discovers that the serial number is still intact, so the rocket should be traceable. A law rocket has a range of only 350 meters, so it must have been fired nearby. 
Agents interview everyone in the surrounding area and locate one woman who says she saw the attackers. This lady said that this guy came into her yard. She came out the door. He told her to get back inside. He puts the law rocket on his shoulder and fires the law rocket at the building. The witness says the man fled in an SUV, which was followed by a car. She describes both vehicles, and agents begin searching the surrounding neighborhoods. The FBI quickly finds the two suspect vehicles nearby. People that lived in the neighborhood told us that they had seen people come dump the vehicle. One of them, the person had actually gotten out of the vehicle and wiped the door, like he was trying to remove evidence of fingerprints from the door of the vehicle, which made it a very highly suspect vehicle. FBI Special Agent Marlene Hunter. We started interviewing the people to get descriptions of the individuals that left the vehicle and just ensure that the vehicle was preserved until the agents could start processing it for evidence. While interviewing witnesses, agents learned from the media that the Macheteros have claimed responsibility. We took it extremely personal extremely personal because it was the first time that the Macheteros had attacked the FBI specifically and we wanted to uh, solve that case. We wanted to charge the Macheteros. To do that, agents must find a way to penetrate their secretive world. The Puerto Rican terrorist organization known as the Macheteros has brought their fight to the FBI's doorstep with a rocket attack on their office in San Juan. Now agents work around the clock to follow up leads. The FBI asks the U.S. Army to run a trace on the rocket serial number, according to FBI Special Agent Jose Rodriguez. In other words, where did it come from? How did the Macheteros get a law ro an American-made law rocket? The military did an outstanding job in tracing it. However, it was told to us that they suspected that some of that lot of law rockets had been left in Vietnam once the Americans had pulled out. And in tracing that, also we found that a ship had carried a large load of uh, American-made weapons from North Vietnam to Cuba at one time. And we suspected that possibly that rocket had have gone to Cuba, and then the Macheteros had obtained it from there. In the FBI garage, agents processed the two vehicles believed used in the rocket attack. The vehicle identification and license plate numbers lead nowhere, and there are no obvious fingerprints. Agents look for evidence lost in crevices or fingerprints left while doing repairs. FBI Special Agent Fernando Candelario. We decided that we're going to do this, and we're, we're going to make sure that uh, we get any piece of evidence that we can off that vehicle. Under a door paneling, Agents find a single fingerprint. Okay, it's clear. Yeah. It's a good FBI one. FBI Special Agent Marlene Hunter. The fact that you were able to lift a print off of the getaway vehicle was very exciting. It was a great break. The FBI matches the fingerprint to known radical Abelino Gonzalez. The fingerprint alone isn't enough to convict him. The FBI considers watching him but fears it will be a waste of manpower since they suspect he will remain low key in the wake of the attack. So you have to have a team of approximately six people, at least in six different cars, to be effective. And it eats up your resources. So one of the particular investigative techniques that was being discussed a lot was wiretap, uh, electronic surveillance. Uh, but where do we go? Do we, do we wiretap Valino? Do we look for a better subject, uh, et cetera, et cetera? In the garage, agents begin taking apart the SUV, which they believe was used to transport the anti-tank rocket. Deep in a pocket in the driver's door, one agent makes a critical discovery. Because it is so humid in Puerto Rico, if you leave paper documents, they'll become sticky and they stick to everything. In this final pocket, we found the corner of a traffic citation the torn bit of traffic ticket includes the entire ticket ID number. That was a very nice uh, stroke of luck that the portion with the number on it 
was preserved. At Puerto Rico's Department of Motor Vehicles, Agent Candelario tracks down the number. He discovers that the original ticket was issued to Pedro Ramirez Cesar Almodovar for an expired inspection sticker. He writes down Almodovar's home address and gets a copy of the original license photo. Agent Candelario has spent hours watching Machetero's suspects, but he doesn't recognize the man. The photo could break the case wide open, or it could be yet another dead end. At the FBI office in San Juan, agents hunt for official records on Pedro Almodovar. We searched everything. Associated by the name birth records. Uh, we searched tax records. Agents find one record with the same name and birth date. It was a dead baby's birth certificate that was used to get this identification. So we knew this person didn't exist uh, as an adult anyway. When the name proves false, agents concentrate on the photo. That photo was copied probably a thousand times, uh, sent everywhere to see if somebody could identify that person. But agents can't find anyone who recognizes the man. Agent Rodriguez goes to the address on Almodovar's driver's license. One address leads to another, where a woman with a Cuban accent answers the door. She insists she doesn't know anyone named Pedro Almodovar. And I took the picture out of my pocket and placed it in front of her face and said, do you know this individual? And it was as if she'd seen a ghost. She almost fell back when she saw the picture and immediately said, no, no, I don't know that individual. Agents are confident she isn't telling the truth. I knew that she knew who that person was. Back at the FBI office, Investigators run the woman's name through a database of possible terrorist supporters. In a major breakthrough, the computer indicates she's related by marriage to the family of Filiberto Ojeda, the suspected leader of the Macheteros. Agents now believe that the man in the photo is actually Ojeda. We compared the photographs of Filiberto Ojeda Rios to Pedro Almodovar. There was a resemblance. Nobody could identify him positively. Agents decide against watching the Cuban woman. They suspect their visit has been reported to the Macheteros, who won't go near her again for months. Instead, agents decide to put intensive surveillance on Abelino Gonzalez, the radical whose fingerprint was found on the getaway car. Two months have passed since the rocket attack, and agents believe the terrorists may feel safe to begin meeting again. The surveillance teams take great pains to avoid being detected. The rule of thumb on that team was don't get burned. If we pick up an individual and um, we lose them in the first half hour, then we'll pick them up the next day. Two weeks into the surveillance, agents watch Gonzalez drive in circles around a parking lot, apparently trying to determine if he's being followed. They were de trying to detect uh, surveillance. It was an exciting moment. Uh, we were observing excellent tradecraft on the part of these two macheteros. Finally, Gonzalez stops and picks up an older man. The decision was made to drop Avelino and concentrate on the person that he was meeting to try to identify him. Agents follow the older man to a second-story apartment an hour from San Juan. Investigators rent an apartment across the street and watch the man. They check the name on his apartment and car registration, but find out that it's false. And we were doing surveillances on him for a few days, and um, he was very, very watchful for surveillance activity. He would use different public phones, and he would use different one every time he'd make a call, even in the same evening. To identify the man, agents come up with a creative plan to obtain his fingerprints. The next time, the older man makes a phone call and leaves. An FBI agent moves in and cuts off the handset.
Even if the suspect notices the cut cord, agents don't believe it will tip him off. We have vandalism here all the time in Puerto Rico, and um, nobody's going to think anything of it. FBI technicians process the payphone receiver and are able to pull fingerprints from it. The FBI lab came back, said that the latent fingerprint that was discovered on that telephone was that of Filiberto Jero Rios. The FBI has found the alleged leader of the Macheteros. It was like Christmas come early. I mean, we were, we had confirmed everything that we suspected, uh, and that's when the, the case was designated a major case of the FBI. Agents could arrest Ojeda on an old warrant for jumping bail. Instead, they decide to continue watching him to try to identify other members of the Macheteros. The FBI wants to take down the entire group and bring peace to this troubled island. A Puerto Rican terror group known as the Macheteros wages an unpopular war for independence, attacking local police, the American military, and the FBI. Although they claim to be freeing the country from American oppression, less than 5% of the island's population supports their cause. After months of intense surveillance of suspected members of the Macheteros, agents have identified the leader of the organization, Filiberto Ojeda, who has been a fugitive for more than a decade. The FBI continues their efforts to identify more members of the group to bring them all to justice. A month after identifying the terror leader, the FBI gets an unexpected break. At an office building in San Juan, police respond to a burglary. An entire floor of the building had been broken into. In one of the offices, authorities found some suspicious documents that appeared to belong to a terrorist group. They called the FBI. FBI agents searched through the office's filing cabinets. FBI Special Agent Marlene Hunter can't believe what they find. Fairly quickly, it became clear that it was the central archives of the Machateros organization. Not only their archives for historical purposes, but also records regarding future actions that they were going to take. Another interesting find were minutes of meetings that went all the way back to the date they were formed in 1976. It was a gold mine. In a chilling moment, Agent Hunter discovers that the terrorists have compiled detailed information on individual FBI agents. There were files with FBI names and their family members, where their children went to school. The threatening discovery underscores the danger to agents and their families. It really made you realize that maybe you needed to not take the same route all the time. You needed to always assume that someone could be following you. Other documents describe the group's terrorist activities, but names for places and people are coded. The FBI takes the files as evidence and attempts to crack the codes. With the evidence collected so far, the FBI gets a judge's authorization to listen to payphones used by Filiberto Ojeda, the alleged leader of the Macheteros. As with their documents, the Macheteros also use code names when speaking on the telephone. FBI Special Agent Fernando Candelario. We heard a lot of conversations where the code name Aguila and Aguila Blanca were mentioned. But in the contents of the conversation, we couldn't really tell what Aguila or Aguila Blanca was. Aguila means eagle, and Aguila Blanca is white eagle. Agents suspect Aguila refers to a person, and Aguila Blanca is an operation that person conducted. Whenever Ojeda arranges to meet someone, agents follow in an effort to determine the new person's identity. If possible, agents retrieve objects the person has touched and send them to the lab to be fingerprinted. Agents use the fingerprint results, surveillances, and wiretaps to match terrorist code names to real names. Agent Hunter leads the effort. I was like jigsaw puzzles when I was a kid, and this was like one big jigsaw puzzle. We had uh, multiple layers of code names 
that we were able to piece together through careful coordination of the physical surveillance logs with the electronic surveillance logs and independent investigation. The FBI identifies more members of the Macheteros one by one. Agents use the new information to get authorization to put a microphone inside Ojeda's apartment. When agents see Ojeda leave one night, they enter to plant the bug. They find the interior doors partly open. Agents recognize this is a clever counter-surveillance tactic. Their MO to protect themselves was to leave interior doors open at a certain gap and they would measure it and in case that door was moved by an agent inserting a microphone in that residence, they would know somebody had been in here. Agents carefully reset each door to avoid tipping off Ojeda. We didn't want him to move. We were afraid if he moved that we'd never find him again. At the FBI office, Agent Hunter continues her efforts to decode a list of names and phone numbers from the Macheteros files. Agents believe the phone numbers have been encoded through a mathematical formula. If the FBI can crack that code, they will have phone numbers for all the Macheteros. Agents capture a real phone number electronically at the same time that they overhear Ojeda call the man by his code name. Agent Hunter uses the real phone number and the corresponding coded phone number to try to figure out the formula. I was able to play around with the sequence of the numbers. and It, it wasn't an easy code. It wasn't you know, like sometimes they add two to everything or subtract one from everything. Her determination pays off. Agent Hunter makes a breakthrough and rushes to tell the team. I went over where they were and, you know, I said, you can't believe this, I just broke the telephone number code. Oh, they were thrilled. Everybody was thrilled with that. That allowed us to decode all the telephone numbers and we could get the real number and we could say who the real person connected to that code name was. So we were able to sort of unmask and figure this group out. With the codes cracked and listening devices in place, the FBI overhears the Mocheteros arguing over money. FBI Special Agent Jose Rodriguez. Oh, Heather wanted to use the money to further the cause of the organization and to establish better relations with the Cubans in Cuba. They had sent, I think it was $2.2 million to the Cubans as a show of good faith. Agents are puzzled by the huge amounts of money that the Mocheteros seem to have. We got $6.8 million that the organization is quarreling over, and we wondered, where did they get this money? Agents totaled the losses of all the recent bank robberies and armored car heists in Puerto Rico, but they don't come close to $6.8 million. Agents send an urgent bullet into all FBI offices, asking if anyone has any unsolved multi-million dollar robberies. An answer comes from Hartford, Connecticut. A year earlier, at an armored car depot, a guard gave co-workers a knockout drug and stole $7.2 million. Agents in San Juan note that the guard in the so-called Big Sleep Heist is Puerto Rican. They suspect that the Machetero operation, codenamed Aguila Blanca, is really the Big Sleep Heist. We decided to pull more tapes, previously transcribed conversations where Aguila and Aguila Blanca were mentioned. And now, with, with the context in mind that this could be the armored car robbery, it started to make sense. The Macheteros had committed this robbery. They hadn't claimed responsibility for it yet, though. It no longer was just an investigation of the law rocket attack on our building. It was a group that had gone to the United States to steal $7 million, which at the time was the second largest robbery in US history. Prosecutors advise the FBI that they would prefer to try the Macheteros in Connecticut for the big sleep heist. They worry that a murder trial in Puerto Rico would fail because jurors would be too frightened. It was going to be difficult to get a jury that would be willing to convict, assuming the evidence was right, a member of the Macheteros. The Macheteros, you mentioned that name in Puerto Rico, and it instilled fear. The FBI decides to continue its surveillance until it gets enough evidence to convict the Macheteros of the big sleep heist. 
but before the FBI gets the additional evidence it needs, Ojeda suddenly disappears. Agents fear that Ojeda has somehow caught on to their surveillance. They will have to get their additional evidence elsewhere. The FBI decides to focus on another target, Ojeda's right-hand man, Juan Segarra. Juan Segarra Palmer was a very active member of the organization, what I would call a shaker and a mover. He was the one that made things happen. He was the brains of the organization. The FBI has a microphone inside Segarra's house, but it has gone dead. Agents watch Segarra and his family drive away and move in to repair the bug, leaving the front door unlocked. The agents fix the broken microphone and prepare to leave. Suddenly, Agent Candelario gets an urgent message. When I am wearing an earpiece with a radio unit, and I hear the green station wagon is coming up to the residence. This is the aircraft is calling this out. An FBI plane has spotted the vehicle of a known member of the Macheteros. He pulls up to the house and notices the unlocked door. When we heard he was in front of the door coming in, we went to the bedrooms. Myself and another agent went into the closet. The closets had no doors. The agents know that the Macheteros are almost always armed. They hear footsteps coming closer. If the terrorist comes into the bedroom, the confrontation could turn deadly. Agents repair a hidden microphone in the home of a suspected member of the Macheteros, Juan Segarra. But just as they finish, a terrorist enters. FBI Special Agent Fernando Candelario and another agent hide in a closet, guns ready. It's obviously a member of the Macheteros, a dangerous terrorist organization coming into this safe house to protect it. We don't know if he's going to come around that corner with a weapon. I'm not going to tell you that we weren't scared. We could hear him speak. He would say, aquí no hay nadie. Is there anybody here? We, we didn't answer. And he'd go to the other door, aquí no hay nadie. The terrorist begins to enter the bedroom. We have no closet doors. We're in an open space. All this guy had to do was walk in and oh, look yeah. to his left, and he would have seen us. And we don't know what would have occurred at that point. If had he assaulted us, then you know there's, there's only one way to go there. We would have shot him. But then he leaves. While the terrorist is in front of the house, the agents escape out the back. Later, agents listen worriedly as the visitor tells Juan Segarra what happened. The terrorists begin searching the house. If they find the microphone, it could ruin years of hard work. FBI Special Agent Jose Rodriguez. What's going to happen to the investigation? Is it burned? Or are all of them going to flee, uh, go underground? But the terrorists fail to find the microphone. Once again, Puerto Rico's high crime rate helps cover the FBI's tracks. We did hear them conversing about uh, this incident. They don't know if it was FBI or not. Could have been a burglar. Agents watch Segarra go out at night to make phone calls, leaving his wife and child at home. Through their listening devices, they hear him make calls to his mistress in Boston about laundering money. She was definitely a player in the organization. She was hiding money for him, and she was also exchanging money that they suspected to be hot for clean bills up in Boston. Agents have just identified a major part of the money trail from the big sleep heist. They apply for authorization to put a listening device on the woman's phone. With new evidence from Segarra, agents begin planning the end game, the takedown of the Macheteros. They want to arrest all the suspects at the same time. We didn't want someone to make a call to somebody else, say, they hit me over here. So we didn't want one team to hit one place and go here and hit another place. We wanted simultaneous hits on these houses. During the arrests, agents also went searches of more than 30 locations all across the island. To make it all happen, the FBI will need nearly 300 agents. 
In preparation for the takedown, the FBI secretly flies hundreds of agents and their equipment to a Navy base in Puerto Rico. We brought down in helicopters, we brought down Suburbans, the HRT brought down all their gear. It was very massive movement of FBI personnel, uh, something I've not seen again in my career. But the FBI has to put the raids on hold when the number two Machitero suddenly goes to Mexico. Juan Segarra Palmer was a very important individual in this case. A lot of the evidence that would point to his guilt would also uh, point to the guilt of others. We needed him at trial. Hundreds of agents wait for Segarra to return to U.S. soil. From the wiretap on his mistress's phone, investigators know that Segarra plans to return soon. A tense week passes. Finally, Segarra leaves a message on her answering machine. He tells her, I'm in Dallas, and here's my phone number where I can be reached. The FBI uses a reverse directory and finds that the number belongs to a payphone at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. Dallas FBI agents find Segarra by a payphone, waiting for his mistress to call back. They plan to arrest him at the same moment as the rest of the raid. In Puerto Rico, agents get into position to hit dozens of locations simultaneously. Here's where the adrenaline started pumping. This was a culmination of a lot of intense work on the parts of a lot of people. At the home of Machetero leader Filiberto Ojeda, FBI SWAT and members of the elite FBI hostage rescue team surround the building and order Ojeda to come out and surrender. They were calling him by name, telling him that we had an arrest warrant, asking him to come out, give himself up. Ojeda doesn't answer. SWAT finally decides to go in and get him. A burst of automatic fire came down the stairwell. One of those rounds uh, ricocheted off the wall and struck the team leader in the, uh, in the eye. Agents pull the injured man to safety and call for a medevac helicopter. They know that soon they'll have to go back inside to confront a terrorist who won't go down without a fight and won't hesitate to kill. The FBI attempts to arrest the leader of a deadly terrorist group, but he opens fire, hitting an HRT member in the eye. After evacuating the wounded man, FBI agents continue to urge the terrorist leader to surrender. FBI Special Agent Jose Rodriguez. Finally, he started coming down the stairs. When he did, he had a Uzi slung over his right shoulder, and his left hand could not be seen. He had his left hand down to the side of his uh, pants. Terrorist leader Filiberto Ojeda continues slowly down the stairs. As he got down to the base of the stairs, he raised his left hand, and the HRT member saw that he had a, a semi-automatic handgun. The HRT member yelled for him to drop it. When he didn't, the HRT member fired two times, and he saw Ojeda buckle, and he thought that he had struck Ojeda in the chest. The shot actually hit Ojeda's handgun. Although unhurt, he gives up. In Dallas, Juan Segarra is arrested without incident. FBI Special Agent Fernando Candelario escorts Ojeda to jail. I told him, I'm a Puerto Rican, and I have as much right to live here as you do. And he told me, yes, but you're the enemy. And if I have to kill you, I will. Over the next three years, Ojeda's attorneys do everything possible to postpone his trial. The case was delayed and delayed and delayed, uh, primarily by the defense, because they filed motion after motion after motion. Well, Heather Rios was in jail for a total of 36 months, primarily based upon defense motions. After all the legal wrangling, his attorneys now claim he must be released on bond because his right to a speedy trial has been violated. The claim goes all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, the Supreme Court rules that Ojeda must be released to await trial. 
Over the FBI's protests, Ojeda goes free, wearing an electronic monitoring bracelet. We knew that wasn't going to hold him. Of course, he wasn't in our custody at that point. He's the responsibility of the pretrial services. While awaiting trial, Ojeda gives speeches to try to build support for the Macheteros. Now he can brag about uh, the Macheteros. Now he's no longer covert, he's overt. While Ojeda's attorneys delay, four other Macheteros, including Juan Segarra, are convicted in Hartford, Connecticut for their roles in the big sleep heist. A year after his release on bond, Ojeda makes a bold statement to the media and cuts off his electronic bracelet. He disappears into the rugged mountains to resume his fight to turn the island into a communist dictatorship. Two years later, a federal court in Connecticut convicts Ojeda in absentia of bank robbery and conspiracy. With his conviction, 14 of the top macheteros have been found guilty. While Ojeda is at large, the FBI keeps up the pressure to find him. FBI Special Agent Fernando Candelario. I'm confident that he'll be arrested again because we did it once before, you know? And when we, um, like they say, we always get our man. And uh, I think that um, with time is on our side. In September of 2005, the FBI locates Ojeda. He is shot and killed after firing on agents. The Macheteros' reign of terror has come to an end. And unless you're committed to go after him with as much commitment as they got, you're not going to get him. They were Macheteros 24 hours a day. The trials also help reveal the truth about the Macheteros. These people don't just want independence for Puerto Rico. These people want something much bigger than that. They want to convert Puerto Rico into the next Cuba. Today, through democratic elections, the people of Puerto Rico retain the right to decide whether to become a state, remain a commonwealth, or become independent. Thanks to the FBI, they remain free to determine their own fate.